Hello everyone, welcome to the first City University of London uh, European Social Survey um, and that's a meta seminar for 2022 to 23 academic year. Uh, my name is Tim Hansen, um, I'm a senior research fellow at European Social Survey headquarters and I'll be chairing today's session. Uh, and we're very pleased to welcome Seth Jolly and Ryan Backer who will be our two speakers today. Uh, Seth is an associate professor of political science at the Maxwell School of Syracuse University. His research focuses on the interaction of political institutions and political parties in Europe. Um, and Ryan is a reader in comparative politics and director of the University of Essex Summer School in Social Science Data Analysis. analysis. Um, and his research interests include party politics, European elections, party vote, vote to linkages, Bayesian modelling and survey research. Uh, Seth and Ryan will be discussing the Chapel Hill Expert Survey today. Uh, they are co-principal investigators for the survey and help to produce the data set. Uh, they will talk for around uh, 45 minutes and there'll be time for some questions at the end. So if you do have questions, please type these in the Q&A area uh, that should be visible on your screen and we'll go through as many questions as we can at the end. So I'll pass over to Seth and Ryan. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, we're excited to be here. Uh, Ryan and I are going to talk about the Chapel Hill Expert Survey, uh, where we've been and where we're going. Uh, I'm going to start off uh, and share, go ahead and share the slides. Um, there we go. Uh, and so, what we are going to talk about today is uh, based a little bit on our most recent paper in electoral studies on the Chapel Expert Survey. Uh, for those of you that don't know, we're not the only people that work on this project. Um, there's actually even more than this um, if you if you include our many experts and RAs, but it's a big team uh, of people from uh, both sides of the pond. Uh, starting with, as you can imagine, it's called the Chapel Hill Expert Survey. Uh, many of our team either started in or studied at uh, Chapel Hill, um, including our colleagues, Lisbeth Hoga and Gary Marks, who are still there. But I'll, I'll get straight into the data. The agenda for today, we're going to talk about the trends in our data, uh, what we see as continuity and change. Uh, and then when we'll shift, uh, Ryan will talk about our special edition chess, what we're calling speed chess. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the one that we uh, did a few years ago on COVID positions. And then we'll talk about how we're extending the Chapel Expert Survey data beyond Europe. So many of you all might be asking, what, what are these data? If you're not familiar, uh, what we do is we track party positions on a variety of issues uh, and larger dimensions. And we've done this since 1999. Uh, we have waves coinciding for the most part with European parliamentary elections. So 1999, 2002, uh, and then the most recent one in 2019. When, when the chess started, it was only 14 countries, the current members. Uh, but at this point, we have many more than that. We have the 28 EU member states. Uh, that's if you count the UK in 2019, uh, plus a variety of other uh, potential members or neighboring countries like Iceland, Norway, Switzerland, Ukraine, Turkey, the Balkans. Uh, importantly, the number of parties grew from 143 in those original surveys to 268. Uh, the trend file itself has party year observations. We make all of these publicly available on our website, chessdata.eu, and you can uh, download the data. We also make the expert level data, uh, which we have between 7 and 30 plus uh, experts per country per year uh, answering questions about these political parties. When the survey started, uh, it, it just measured pretty much party positions toward the EU with a little bit of focus on left right uh, as a background. It's basically trying to understand why some parties are more or less uh, Eurosceptical. Over time, we've added uh, continuously to both the geographic and substantive scope. Uh, and in particular, we focused more on specific policy positions. And what we've been able to do um, since 2006, in particular, we added 18 different policy positions across a range from deregulation, multiculturalism, environment, uh, the way um, minorities are treated, uh, a variety of other issues to try to unpack exactly what goes into these larger dimensions. 
And this is really the part of the project that Ryan and I focus on in our own research. With this, we work on multidimensional complexity, what goes into each dimension across countries, uh, how politics is competed and contested across party spaces uh, in Europe. Um, and so these specific issue policy positions allow us to do this. We're also um, the, the longest running expert survey um, that includes both these policy positions and salience positions for many of these issues. So we're able to not only track uh, where the parties place are placed in the space, we're also able to figure out um, what experts think are the most important issues um, in that space. In previous work, uh, before our most recent paper in electoral studies, there were papers on the reliability and validity of the data, comparing it to things like uh, the comparative manifesto data, for instance, or other expert surveys or public opinion surveys. Uh, and in more recent years, uh, Ryan and I and John Jonathan Polk and others have written a lot on the cross-national comparability. One of the biggest issues with expert surveys is whether or not um, the simple way to put it is, is a three on the left right scale uh, in the UK, the same as a three in Italy, the same as a three in uh, the United States, for instance, as we'll talk about later in the in the talk. So what we're interested in is making sure that the issues, the issue positions that we place are cross nationally comparable, so that we can do good comparisons uh, and provide reliable and valid data to to our users. One of the things uh, that fascinated us, and we were a little bit surprised, to be honest, is just how stable party positions have been in Europe on a lot of issues, in particular the EU. So one of the classic findings, going back to uh, Marx and Hoga's early work in the two, early 2000s, is what they called the inverted U. Parties with extreme left positions and extreme right positions are Euroskeptical. Everyone in the middle is pro-EU. Uh, relatively speaking. And you see this pretty clear in this trend over time. It gets a little messier. Um, there are certainly centrist parties uh, that are more Eurosceptical in these later years in 2019, for instance. But for the most part, that um, that inverted U is still pretty clear um, in the data. One big change that we noticed that actually fits with the theoretical literature on party positions in Europe is that uh, in those early years, EU positions were highly connected to economic positions. So where, where a party was on their economic left, right, was a big factor in determining where they sat in the EU, whether they were pro-Europe or anti-Europe. These days, it's far more connected with their uh, Sociocultural positions, the Galtan, what we call Galtan, green alternative libertarian, traditional authoritarian nationalist position. And there's a recent literature, a new literature, uh, Hans Peter Kriese and co authors, Hoga Marx, uh, and others, Catherine de Vries, who have talked about transnational cleavages in particular that are pitting parochial nationalist parties against cosmopolitan parties. And on this, it's, it's not all of Galtan uh, that the that the model fits. It's actually primarily immigration, multiculturalism, factors like this that that really feed into um, this new cleavage um, that's separating parties. And so that's some of the work that um, Ryan and uh, John Polk and I have worked on recently. We just presented work on this at APSA, and we'll do so again coming up. In many ways, what's striking again is the stability and is the stability in EU positions. Some of this fits nicely with the literature. We have uh, Kitzolt's uh, 1994 book taught us about the stickiness of party strategies, why it's so hard for parties to move, depending on their uh, internal party structure. Uh, and others talk about issue ownership. And what we're seeing now is just how hard it is for social democrats to move to try to compete with the radical right on their main issues. You can see those positions on specific issues, especially secondary issues, likely to change over time as, as that salience goes up and down. But just in terms of the stability of the EU positions, these simple box plots, what they show is over time for both the East and the West, there's some variation for sure. Um, 
like you you definitely get uh some party systems being um anti-eu but the medians have not changed much these box plots show not too much variation 2002 uh was sort of an outlier and being a little higher in the west um there's almost no change in the east in terms of support for the eu uh and overall it's just barely gone up in terms of the mean from 4.7 to a 5.05 What we do find, though, is that there is quite a bit of variation in the party positions, the party family positions, um, and it's but it's between those families, not within the families. The, the within the families don't change that much. So it does just like that inverted U that I showed at the beginning. Christian Democrats and Socialists tend to be more supportive. Extreme parties on the left and right, much less so, and in fact, have only become less supportive over time. Um, there is some east-west difference, but it's modest relative to the others. So I'll show a, a series of dot plots showing this. And what you see is that like the radical right um, haven't changed too much um, within the party family over time. The conservatives haven't either. The liberals are all in the same ballpark as where they were in 1999. What, but you see dramatic differences between the radical right and the conservatives, between the radical right and the greens. Um, and, and all of these families. So it's really between families where you see the variation in support for the EU, not within family. The only two that, that change that I'll talk about briefly are, one is the agrarian center party, and that's largely due to, um, it's a very small party family in our measurement. Um, and there, there are a few parties that dropped out that were sort of Euroskeptical in those early years. So that that one's more of an artifact than of, than of theoretical interest. The Greens are where um, you see quite a bit of change, and so I'll focus a little more attention on that party family. They go from being modestly pro-Europe to being among the more supportive party families um, by 2019. Just briefly, you do get some, some uh, face validity uh, options when you do this. You see the most anti-EU parties in Europe tend to be uh, far-right parties like the Golden Dawn, UKIP in, in 2019, the French National Rally, um, and the most pro-Europe parties, um, it's a mix. Some left-wing parties, some liberal parties. The Green parties are what I wanted to talk a little bit about, though, because they have seen the most, um, the most change in the mean over time. They went up a full point. And we have a few different explanations that we talk a little bit about in our electoral studies paper. Um, the first is that many Green parties have shifted from being traditional challenger parties in the DeVries and Hubble schema to being um, mainstream, uh, competing for government, um, like they did in Germany in the recent election. And they have higher levels of support across. What that means oftentimes is that they have more office-seeking strategies, they expand their portfolio, um, they, there's a little bit less green policy purity and more uh, expansive portfolios for lack of a better word. And the Greens have increasingly see the EU as the best vehicle for some of the environmental sustainability goals. Um, we talk about this quite a bit in the electoral studies paper. This graph, I think, highlights some of what's going on. And what you see on the x-axis is the vote share um, and a pretty clear, um, the higher the vote share for the Green parties, the more support it tends to be for the European Union. And that fits in general with the inverted U sort of model, um, but it also fits more generally with the story that we were telling about the Green parties, that as they become more mainstream, more competing for larger vote shares, like you see a lot of the Xs, the 2019s are in that 10 to 15 range, um, that, that's where you see higher levels of support for the EU. And uh, I would say, um, Tim, if you see any clarification questions along the way, feel free to share those. Uh, and well, happy to answer. What um, our team is particularly interested in, though, is EU positions are stable, but the relationships among the dimensions we think are unstable. They've actually changed quite a bit over time. So you do get similar relationships. Tends to be the case that right-wing parties, economic, right-wing economic parties are more pro-EU, um, although there's a curvilinear relationship. 
you do tend to see tan parties, which are traditional authoritarian nationalists, the, the right populist parties tend to be anti-EU, not tend to be, they are anti-EU. But you actually see the relationships among these three dimensions shifting. So these simple models um, highlight this quite a bit. So on the left-hand side, you see uh, a, two columns, one with bivariate models with the R-squareds. So these are just simple bivariate models. The Galtan, uh, as the independent variable in a model explaining EU position, it's only doing 0 0.06 worth of work in terms of R-squared. By 2019, that's up to a third of the explanatory power. In contrast, the left-right economic explained 26% of the, or achieved 26.26 on the R-squared. But by 2019, that's down to 0 0.10. So it's it's almost exactly flipped, where Galtan is way more important in explaining this is on its own without, without a complicated model. And if you shift towards a more complete model, not a not a complete model, but just, just these all three of these, including a squared term, what you see is um, still increasing power of Galtan by just a little bit, but you see a decreased uh, effect of left-right economics. This highlights this a little bit. So Galtan, what you see on the left-hand side, um, the complete line, um, the full line is um, flatter. It's not as not as steep of a of a slope. Whereas the dashed line, the 2019, um, definitely has a has a steeper uh, fit, and you see the opposite for the economic left right. So the fitted line shows a flatter curve um, in 2019 than it showed in 1999. So what we're trying to highlight is the differing relationships among these three uh, distinct dimensions. To, to go a little further, what we do is we we interact Galtan with dummies for each year, and then we compare the marginal effects. We use a Bayesian approach here to compare those marginal effects. So we do some samples from posteriors of marginal effects and compare the effect sizes. So this is the last slide I'll show on this particular part of it. What we see in 1999 is that the effect is in that 0.35 range stays there, it actually weakens a little by 2006. Um, and by 2019, it's all the way up to 0 0.5, uh, negative 0 0.5, that is. So as you go up on the tan scale, you get more traditional authoritarian, you're becoming less supportive of the EU. So the relationship is becoming more significant um, in explanatory power over time. Just to wrap up what we've been talking about, the, in many ways, the party positions toward the EU have remained remarkably stable. We were actually, to be honest, a little surprised at this. We didn't pre-register this study, um, but we expected more change after the Euro crisis, after um, the refugee crisis, um, all of these things after Brexit. Um, but we see a lot of stability over time in party positions. Where we see some changes uh, and what we're interested in exploring further in our own work um, is the relationship between the EU position and the party positions on everything else, basically. And what we think is happening is that immigration um, has become such a critical, vital piece of the puzzle for parties across the space. And we can see this in the two recent elections in Sweden and Italy, just how powerful a role immigration positions played and in some cases, parties mismanaged <laughs> selling it to their voters um, and, and how much it structures party competition. So that's what we're looking to do um, in our future work. And that's where I will stop sharing and pass it off to my colleague, Ryan. All right, <clears throat> thanks, Seth. And uh, thanks to Stefan and to Tim, uh, just echoing Seth's opening remarks for having us here. Um, you know, we, we've always uh, very much looked up to the work done by the European Social Survey Group. And so it's an honor for us to be here. So, all right, well, just to pick up where Seth left off, um, 
you know, uh, the, the survey has been quite successful. We've, we've, we're very happy with where it is in its current condition. Uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't challenges and any of those, uh, any of you who might be in the business of collecting survey data are certainly familiar with uh, lots of challenges that, that we face. Um, so a few of the most noticeable challenges facing chess moving forward is this tension between a need to preserve a time series. And, and, and so what this means is maintaining the same set of questions wave after wave after wave so that we can actually you know, potentially analyze dynamics over time. Um, but this is problematic when we consider the constant arrival of new issues that we might want to know more about parties' positions on. And so the real struggle here from the survey construction perspective is uh, managing the work that we're asking our experts to do. Because every time we add a new question to the survey, we're actually adding K questions where K is the number of parties in a given country, right? So, so for some of our experts in places like the Netherlands and Spain, um, adding a couple questions to the survey can uh, increase the, the, the workload uh, non-trivially, put it like that. Um, additionally, we, we face the issue of, uh, you know, a pretty long gap between survey waves. And this is something that we hear a lot from users of the data. Um, is that they would like to have more regularly collected data. And, and we would too, but you know, it's a monumental task. And, um, and lots and lots of people are doing expert surveys now. They've become more and more common over the past decade or so. And so we run into a problem of survey fatigue, um, you know, obviously very closely related to response rates. And so, so there's always challenges there. So <clears throat> we were thinking about ways to address some of these challenges. And one exciting new innovation that we've come up with is something that we've called uh, special edition chess or speed chess. I was accused of coming up with uh, that name just for the acronym, which I will say is not entirely untrue. But anyway, so uh, speed chess is this idea where we could have, you know, uh, theoretically we've been talking about doing quarterly surveys where we're asking about questions about a specific theme and, and asking a, a very small number of questions, ideally five or fewer. Um, <clears throat> and these are surveys that we can put in the field very quickly um, when new topics arise, when some new salient issue comes on the, on the playing field or some sort of exogenous shock. And as we all are unfortunately all too aware, um, you know, we had no better example of a salient exogenous shock than the COVID pandemic. And so, a couple of years ago, when the pandemic first broke out, um, we fielded a very short four question survey um, about partisan reactions to the pandemic. And <clears throat> we were really interested in whether or not there were national differences, that is, were some countries, regardless of the regardless of what party it was, were some systems more likely to react in different ways. Um, and or, or were there more interesting differences in terms of ideological positions of parties within countries? And so it really was a question of how important are ideological positions to responses to the pandemic. And so specifically, we asked questions about whether or not <clears throat> parties would support protecting the economy, keeping the economy open versus containing the virus. Uh, on a, an additional question on whether or not uh, uh, restrictions should be voluntarily enforced or enforced by government. And we also asked a question about how important science is for policy making. Let's briefly let you see there, there's the wording of those three questions. And so on the first question, <clears throat> you know, higher values uh, represented more, a party being more uh, geared towards containing the virus as opposed to keeping the economy open. On the enforcement question, higher values meant uh, parties supported self-enforcement as opposed to government enforcement of public health measures. And on the third question, higher values represent uh, <clears throat> more belief that science is essential for policymaking as opposed to it not being so. Okay, so we were able to actually field this survey and, uh, and get the data back uh, very quickly. Um, in fact, uh, you know, we took, I think we took longer arguing over question wording than we did actually uh, fielding or collecting the data. So 
it was within about a week of having the survey in the field that we had the data. And so after we collected those data, then we ran a series of multi-level models where we were uh, using each of those three survey questions as dependent variables. And we were interested in whether or not there were ideological explanations for parties' positions on these three, three questions. And um, you know, I'll, I'll summarize this on the next slide a little more completely. But we can see here that for containment, certainly left-right economic position appears to matter. Same with science is essential. Galtan obviously mattered a bunch there. Similarly with attitudes towards voluntary enforcement versus government enforcement. So there did appear to be an ideological component to parties' reactions to COVID. Um, again, more slightly more uh, complete on containing the uh, virus versus keeping the economy open. We see unsurprisingly that economically right-wing parties were more in favor of, of uh, keeping the economy open. In terms of enforcement, both economic right-wing and socially more left libertarian parties uh, were more in support of voluntary enforcement versus government enforcement. And then finally, trust is essential. Um, we really see that the GAL parties, the socially left liberal parties, were much more likely to rely on, on science than the cultural uh, right parties. So, um, you know, a neat little finding there. We, 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 I, thought, I thought it was important that we, that we could show that, but I, I think uh, the bigger picture here is highlighting the, uh, the ability to field a survey quickly uh, when an exogenous shock hits. So, um, so picking up there, right, the exogenous shock hot topic issue uh, worked very nicely, or it, it, this, this format works very nicely for such things. Um, but the idea of sort of branching out beyond the types of questions that those of us involved in constructing the survey historically um, have focused on, that is moving into to, uh, a more diverse set of issue topics that we'd be asking about, certainly has the potential advantage of increasing our user base, making the data more valuable and, and attractive to a wider group of scholars. We've already seen that a little bit with the COVID paper, as some health policy people have cited, uh, cited that paper, which is I'm not sure a first for chess, but certainly not a common group to use our, our data. Um, we also, you know, as we discussed briefly a bit ago, we have the issue of re respondent or expert fatigue to be concerned about. One nice thing about speed chess is <clears throat> that we will um, eventually be able to offer small compensation to our respondents in, in, a, in a sense, almost have a group of experts that we, we would keep on sort of standby um, and, and be able to give a bit of a, a financial compensation to. Um, also, the surveys would be very, very short, as we mentioned previously, right? So these are not uh, very difficult tasks for the experts. However, on the flip side of that, um, some we, we could potentially be surveying about topics that would be of much more uh, challenge for, say, a generalist party expert. And so we may uh, have the need for specific types of speed chess modules to actually uh, hunt for a specific topic uh, expertise in the, in the experts that our generalists might not have. So, but it's an exciting new innovation. And uh, the first COVID round was such a success. We'll, we'll be having more speed chess rounds in the very near future. <clears throat> um, so while speed chess helps overcome some of the challenges that we outlined a few slides back, namely, the, the, the sort of temporal gap that exists between waves combined with the, the great cost that, that can be incurred by adding new questions to the core survey, right? So speed chess helps with, with those two things. Um, another uh, uh, goal of the chess group for many years has been to not just expand our topical breadth beyond the sort of core topics that we've asked about previously, but to also expand our geographic uh, uh, spread. And so um, we have for several years now actually been fielding chess surveys um, in, in some other places outside of the EU and uh, EU neighbors. Um, and for example, we've got three waves of data from the United States, um, two waves for Australia, We've also just recently uh, completed data collection in 16 Latin American countries, um, and uh, very recently just completed uh, a, in a round of chess in Israel. Um, 
it looks like we'll be doing another round of chess in Israel very shortly, uh, given the upheaval there. Um, and so that's all really exciting for us. And uh, we will have a, our second round of Canadian uh, data will be in the field shortly. And then we will soon be expanding to East Asia, uh, namely Korea and Japan are the first places we're going to go there. But with, uh, with, with sites set for even grander uh, coverage than this. Ultimately, our goal is to be able to collect data on a regular basis in every country that contests democratic elections. And obviously there'll be some, uh, there's some subjective component to determining whether or not an election is democratic. And so there will certainly be some discussions about um, whether there, there are some countries we might not include, but, uh, but broadly speaking, we aim to cover as much of the world as possible. Um, Another feature that we don't really have time to go into detail in here today uh, of the chess data for several years since 2014 um, has been the inclusion of, of what are called anchoring vignettes. As Seth alluded to earlier, we, um, you know, there's always that question about the uh, cross-national comparability of party positions. And by including what are called anchoring vignettes, and there's a pretty vast methodological literature on the use of those, um, uh, we were able to overcome what's often referred to as differential item functioning, and then to be able to come up with cross-nationally comparable measures of party positions. And we have published a few papers on that with Europe, but with the geographic expansion, we're also including those anchoring vignettes, which then allow us to make comparisons about party positions, both within regions, but also between regions. So um, some exciting future analyses coming uh, hopefully very shortly. So just to you know, take a quick look here, um, <clears throat> these are for the, the party positions um, on the left-right scale here is, <clears throat> sorry, on the x-axis here is uh, an economic left-right scale, right? So we can, I don't have the party labels on here, we wouldn't be able to read them if they were, right? But we can see parties um, in Australia, Europe, Latin America, United States, and these scales have all been diff corrected using a procedure called Bayesian aldrich mckelvey scaling, which takes advantage of these anchoring vignettes. And so these, uh, uh, you know, these, these placements in Europe and Latin America, even though they uh, are across many, many countries are cross-nationally comparable. So this is kind of cool, right? We can do things like talk about what is the most economically right-wing and most economically left-wing party in Latin America or Europe or something to, to that effect. Um, and we can also, because we have the vignettes everywhere, we can also come up with a scale um, of, of putting all parties on, on one common scale. And so <clears throat> again, party labels would be, would be uh, problematic to put it mildly here, but we can see that the most economically right wing in these, uh, combining these four regions is a Latin American party. And the most economic, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, a right wing, the most economically right wing is a Latin American party. The most economically left wing uh, is a European party. Um, you know, the United States color uh, marker color doesn't really show up there very well, but uh, I know that the, uh, the, the Senate Republicans are right about here is where they are. So it's the most right-wing uh, actor in the United States. So anyway, so again, some interesting stuff there and lots of um, exciting, innovative types of research questions that one could ask about uh, uh, global party placements. So more on that coming soon. And with that, um, we will conclude. Um, as Chess mentioned, I'm sorry, as Chess, as Seth mentioned earlier, all of our data, um, including the, the non-European, so the Latin American, US, and, and Australian, and soon to be Israeli data, are all freely available on the, on the website. And uh, we look forward to you using it and uh, more immediately to any questions or comments that, that you may have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ryan. Thank, thank you, Seth, for a fantastic presentation. Um, that was really interesting, really great to hear about the history of, um, of chess and also where you're going in the future. Uh, lots of really great innovations. Uh, please do uh, type any questions you have in the Q&A for our participants. Um, there's nothing there at the moment, but typically in these sessions, we tend to get quite a few coming in a rush just after the speakers have finished so uh hopefully we'll we'll get some we do have some time uh Seth and Ryan have finished a little bit ahead of schedule so we have plenty of time for questions um 
I was particularly interested in the uh, maybe I'll just talk a little bit while the questions are coming in. But I was particularly interested in the uh, in, in the speed chess. Um, I, I mean, it's a similar challenge to, to we have on the European Social Survey, where you have this very large challenge in kind of big survey every couple of years. Um, and occasionally you want to be more reactive to events kind of in between and thinking how you can go about that. So it seemed like a really great innovation, um, particularly around the pandemic. I, I just wondered if, um, I think you put a few topics on the slide, but are there any other speed chess surveys kind of imminent or, or what's the next thing that you're, you're hoping to look at with that? I was going to say ahead, Seth. Uh, there, there's a bit of internal debate over this too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, okay. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I can say I can say the ones that I, I'm on the side of pushing for. So we're sort of figuring out exactly how we want to do this. Um, so we, we certainly think um, that we could use we could use more information about uh, party positions on Ukraine and Russia. And so that's that's something that we have interest in in fielding, just figuring out. Um, I mean, even in Italy, it comes up because um, the what looks to be the new governing coalition disagrees quite a bit about um, what to do um, with that conflict. Another thing, um, the the other two that we're sort of figuring out how to it are about the environment. Right now, we really only have one one major question about the environment, and it's it's not really um, getting at all of all of the nuance of of different environmental issues. And so, if we could do uh, one only on environmental issues. I think it would allow us to to unpack a lot of that. And the third, a weakness of our study and and the other party position studies, to be honest, is about gender. Um, we again only have one question on gender more generally, and it's not. Um, it just doesn't get at all of the nuance and interesting potential ideas that um, that we could do if we asked even four or five questions. Like I think the key with the the smaller surveys is we can leverage our bigger survey um with all of those questions but then just go a little bit deeper on particular topics brian were there others that we've discussed uh, that we've uh john john polk um another one of our co-pis is uh has a has a trade policy chess in or speed chess in the works as well i'm i'm most certainly not doing that justice i think it's it's uh, there's something a little bit more there than trade policy but uh <laughs> well, I yeah. think what you can yeah. tell from each of these topics that we're talking about, like th those, those are not areas of expertise. Um, Ukraine, certainly for me, um, environmental politics um, and trade policy. And so th that's why when Ryan was introducing it, we have to bring in other other folks to help lead those smaller teams. And so um, that's that's kind of yeah. the process we're figuring that out. And considerably less concrete uh, than those ideas is. Uh, floating around the idea of also doing a a chess leaders survey so actually asking about individuals rather than parties um now, okay. i'm not sure that would be a speed chess but but it's an, a, another interesting yeah. potential yeah okay yeah certainly lots of interesting topics at the moment to consider uh right we've got a couple of questions so um i'll quickly ask them so uh one from isabella belletta um Thank you for the presentation. Uh, and also, I wonder, though, whether it's really accurate to compare, for example, the Green Party in Ireland and the Greens in Germany. Coming from France and Italy when arriving in Ireland, I would not compare the Irish Green and the Continental Greens, despite the name similarities. What are the criteria used to compare them? Hmm. So I, I think I can take this one and you can take the next question, Ryan. Um, so in, in general, what we do when we're comparing party families is we use... Um, to, we use a variety of things to classify parties into families. And it's it's each time we have to kind of go through, we look at their ideology, we make judgments based on their past. There's always some parties that are a little confusing. So for instance, the party that, that in, in my own work, since I'm interested in regionalism, um, is Lega or formerly Lega Nord, um, which we did classify as a regionalist party for a long time, but has has turned into what we call a radical right party. Um, and so which, which is it when you do this? So right now, I think we have it labeled as radical right. What, what we tend to do is we classify them based on um, the classic things that um, party experts do. We classify them based on shared origins, cooperation, like in European parliamentary groups, 
and, and name, like Isabella pointed out. Um, that's not always ideal, right? Um, you sometimes um, sometimes you would classify them a little differently. And so like we say that in the code book, like this is our classification, change, change the coding if you want. I think in the particular case um, that Isabella is asking about, I think there is variation within each party family, um, especially the Greens, in terms of how mainstream they try to be, how much they prioritize environmental issues versus other things. The Greens in Germany are quite a bit different, obviously, than than some of the others who are still um, who are, uh, I'm not I'm not as familiar with the Irish Green, but that's that's what I would say is like the criteria is we group them into families for comparison purposes, but they're they're separated in the data set, so you can do whatever you want with them. Just okay. tag onto that real quick. It is it is it was an unforeseen result how controversial the party family variable in the data set has been through the years. It's uh, something that people have had. Uh, it might be the thing people have commented the most on, as a matter of fact, through the years. Yeah, but yeah, uh, just to somewhat yeah, echo what Seth said. Some of these choices are are, are uh, definitely not easy to make when it comes to putting parties in families. Sure. Great, thank you. Uh, keep the questions coming. We've definitely got time for some more. Uh, there is one more uh, that's coming from Roxandra Komenaru. Um, Can you tell us a bit about the mode of data collection for chess and speed chess? Sure, thanks for the question, uh, Roxandra. And assuming I understand your question correctly, and please chime in if, I, if I'm not understanding it correctly, uh, the, the, they're web-based surveys. So uh, we use Qualtrics and um, uh, not sure how much else there is to say uh, than that, as I said, unless you had a more uh, uh, slightly more detailed question than that. But we, we identify country experts, um, which is a rather time consuming task that we do uh, for several, several weeks, months before the survey goes in the field. And then, uh, yeah, shoot out, shoot out the emails, uh, usually send two reminders um, and then, uh, and then if we need to, uh, we start sending individualized emails to folks to try to get, if we need more, more responses. Yeah. I mean, but this is what yeah. separates like an expert survey from something like what ESS has to do. Like the, the types of survey collection that the European social survey or the European election surveys or whatever has to do is a lot more time consuming and expensive at the individual level. What we're doing is asking other academics to give us half hour to an hour depending on the country and their expertise um, of time and so um, we and what we've discovered over time is you and this is true Roy Schneider and Whitfield and others found this too you don't need that many experts it's not like public opinion surveys so you know as long as we have more than seven or eight per country and we try for a lot more than that um, we we tend to get pretty stable answers within a country when we don't get stable answers um, it tends to be um, for strategic reasons, actually, like um, our colleague Jan Ravney writes a lot about um, blurring um, in party positions. And we find that in the, um, we actually find that in the experts' responses, they tend to not be able to place them as clearly um, when, when strategically they have reason to blur their position, like the radical right parties tend to blur their economic positions um, and the experts pick up that. Yeah, it's it's uh, that's actually funny because some of the when Seth was showing the inverted U graphs, some of those moderate looking parties on the left right dimension were showing up as kind of euro skeptic when we would expect moderate parties to be more pro Europe. But I think some of those moderate positions were exactly what Seth was just describing, right? They were just sort of uh, averages of a bunch of uncertain responses, and and so they. So uh, famously, the Five Star Movement, when they first came into the data set the first year, they were in the data set, experts had no idea what to do with them. And they ended up showing up as like a five on a 11-point on a, uh, scale. So sometimes that happens, yeah. Great. What is, just out of interest, what is a kind of range of experts you have between countries? What's the sort of lower number you might get in a country to the, to the kind of maximum? And are you referring to completed responses or...? or uh, well, that's maybe a related point. Maybe you could cover yeah. that as well, because I was also I was also wondering what sort of proportion of people you asked actually complete. Because um, I guess it's quite a big commitment in terms of the time to do it, 
Um, but equally, it's, you know, it's a pretty to just study in a field that they're familiar with, probably. So you'd have thought people would be quite keen to do it. So, yeah, maybe you could cover both of those points in terms of yeah. uh, numbers and also kind of, you know, who, who actually, what proportion kind of complete it. And so we generally have, and I'm sorry to be ballparking this, Seth, if you have a better recollection, uh, but I, I think we're usually sending out a minimum of 50 email invitations. So, so, uh, so identifying enough experts is, has never been a problem for the countries that we're, we've been surveying. Mm. Um, and response rates vary, you know, <laughs> I suppose uh, in not a terribly surprising way to Europeans. Um, so, uh, you know, the Swedes and the Germans um, uh, send in lots of responses in a short period of time. And uh, sometimes Iberia, uh, <laughs> you know, Spain, Portugal, Greece might take a little bit longer. Um, mm. Uh, but generally, we're in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 percent response rate. OK, so, um, yeah. And again, that, that does vary drastically. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. OK, you, great. Thank you. I'll move on to a couple more questions that have come in, which is great. So a question from John Minter. Um, thank you for the talk. And has the Latin America data set made comparability more difficult? Is there anything you have to consider that you didn't before? And has this proven that expansion into other parts of the world would be feasible? Yeah, that's great. Great question. Um, so uh, has it made comparability more difficult? Well, I think, unfortunately, the answer to that question is yes and no. Um, in, 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 in one sense, there was no problem uh, constructing, well, a little bit of a backstory, but in order to create these cross-nationally comparable measures, what, what is required is that we can come up with these hypothetical, what, what's called anchoring vignettes. So we give a, a very brief description of hypothetical parties and ask experts to place those. And then every expert places those same hypothetical parties, regardless of what country she's an expert in. Okay, and we can use that information then with a reasonably complicated scaling technique to, uh, to develop a scale that then uh, 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 takes into account where experts place these hypothetical parties relative to where they place their own parties and then can correct for any potential uh, uh, differences in understanding of the underlying scale. Okay, and happy to uh, uh, yeah, send you some citations for that stuff if you're interested in more of the details of, of what's called aldrich McKelvey scaling. But um, so now is the answer to your question. For an economic dimension, uh, it was it, there was no problem for us constructing these hypothetical vignettes in a way that would make sense to Latin Americans, to Europeans, to Australians, to North Americans. Okay. Um, however, with the, the cultural dimension, so in 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 EU, uh, we've been we've also included anchoring vignettes on the Galtan, this cultural dimension, and also on EU position. Um, however, trying to develop a cross-nationally hypothetical cultural dimension uh, uh, set of parties, we just couldn't come to agreement on how to do that um, because that cultural dimension is so very, very different. Um, uh, whereas the classic economic dimension of redistribution of wealth sort of based issues seems to travel much, much better uh, across regions. So yeah, so yes and no is, is, is my answer to that. Um, Brian, if you don't mind, uh, just Please. like I think part of part part of the difference in going to other places is you you want to make the data most useful for scholars from that region, yeah. Um, and so you want some comparability across, um, but there's a lot of questions on the Latin American survey that don't make a lot of sense in the European context, and vice versa. So they ask a lot more questions about clientelism, a lot more about corruption and patronage, and whether parties are programmatic and. There's questions about the president of the party, or I mean the president, not just the party, um, about crime and how crime should be handled and indigenous people, indigenous peoples. So I think part of that's not as much of a challenge as much as the the goal is we bring in experts from other regions to lead those teams as opposed to um, the European <laughs> experts going to Latin America and saying answer these questions that are useful for us. Um, and so the the team that that runs the Latin American surveys, like it's Jonathan Hartland, it's Nicolas de, de la Cerda, it's uh, Cecilia Martinez Gallardo. Um, so people like experts on the region, 
along with us who have expertise in the expert survey domain uh, working on that. And same thing with the other parts yeah. of the- Australia of the was, was run by three Australian scholars, Canada is being run by a Canadian scholar and so on and so forth, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah. So yeah, actually Seth, that was perfect what you just said. That was, those were the sorts of things we also had to consider, John, uh, moving into Latin America for this example. Um, moving into East Asia, uh, that's going to take a considerable amount of work before that survey would be ready um, as that classic sort of Western conceptualization of left-right politics doesn't really fit in, in a place like Korea, for example. And so, uh, so yeah, we definitely will have to, um, uh, well, let me put it a different way. I think there are things about, for example, Korea that I know we're going to consider, and I don't think we know what those even are yet. So, um, so yeah, we definitely need to be careful with those sorts of things. But my answer to your final question is absolutely. I, I, I think that expansion globally is, um, is feasible. The only, uh, well, I shouldn't say only, but the primary uh, hindrance I see moving forward is being able to find experts. Um, you know, uh, it's challenging to find enough experts on Malta for example. So I would imagine in, in some, some smaller countries, uh, finding experts would be, a, would be the primary challenge we face. Yeah. Sure, uh, we've got about five minutes to go. So if anyone's got any more questions, please post. Um, there's just one from Jeremy Darrington. Um, you mentioned collecting data for Australia and the US multiple ways. However, I don't see the data on your site. Is the data going to be posted at some point in the future? Yes. <laughs> that, that, that just happened in our private WhatsApp. It's like, yeah, yeah. Wait, it's like, wait, oh, the Australia data is not up there. Sorry, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it will be up there. Very. Uh, it's well, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for Seth's work work model, but uh, I would think um, <laughs> within days. Oh, great. Yeah. Is Thank that fair, you. Seth? Okay. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, okay, any more questions for anyone? Please do type them in the Q&A. Uh, there's a, maybe more of a comment from Isabella Bulletti, uh, just commenting on another interesting aspect is the importance of the party, straight number of members and who they represent and gives the example of Nigel Farage um, and UKIP in the UK. Um, not sure that particular query for you there. I don't know if you had any thoughts on, on that general point. Well, I think the, it, I think uh, one of the things that Ryan mentioned was that um, we've had questions from people. Sometimes we get questions from like the Financial Times or the Economist to to ask more about our data or to just take our experts. Um, but the um, one of the things that they often want is positions on specific people, um, and they can get very specific about this. We haven't done that in in Europe yet. But um, Ryan showed, if, if you're familiar with US politics, there are only two parties really. And, but Ryan showed the US data, there are like eight data points on there. So it's, it's actually Senate Republicans, House Republicans, Romney, um, Biden. It's, it's a bunch of it's actual yeah. names. And so we're able to do this in, in that way. And so like, it's perfectly plausible, especially in a place like the UK to ask specifically about Nigel Farage, to ask about Corbyn versus other labor potential leaders, that kind of thing to get to get more specific. Um, it just it it does increase complexity for the experts um, because if you ask about each one of these positions, um, it would it would be a lot, I think. Yeah. I should say we will very shortly uh, be putting out a, a brief UK addendum for the uh, to get to get the Liz Trust government positions for just a handful of variables, not the full data set, but uh, so that that will be uh, that will be available hopefully within a couple of weeks. Okay, very interesting at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, okay, just another um, one from Jeremy. Uh, discussion methodology and how you and your experts approach scale of the part in different regions is insightful and very helpful. I didn't see it on the website. Uh, it would be helpful to post, um, maybe it's in society papers, if so, identify that clearly on the website would be helpful too. So I guess a request there. Sure. Um, is my email address available to everyone, Tim? Um, it, I, it should be, yeah. I'll, I'll okay. follow up with Stefan, but um, I'm sure once we send round um, a follow-up, we can we can include your contact details there. I was going to say, Jeremy, if you can just send me an email or you can just look me up, Baker, double K at Essex. Um, 
I, I'm happy to, to send you a couple of those papers. Yeah. Wor working papers, right? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Maybe I misread that. Um, well, there, he's talking about the, the BAM, the global BAM, BAM scaling paper. Oh, yeah, but I think if I'm understanding you correctly, Jeremy, you might just be interested in the Bayesian Aldrich McKelvey scaling technique um, in and of itself. Yeah, unfortunately, the participants can't, can't no, speak, no worries. so we'll wait, no we'll worries. kind of wait. Uh, Maybe he'll type an yeah. answer soon. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's also about the cool graph where you showed, and you can do cross-national comparability from US yeah. to Australia, but that that's a paper in progress, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But we've got papers on that, looking at the cross-national compar comparability within Europe. Um, we've got a handful, a handful of papers on that are out there. Okay, great. I think um, oh, just one oh, more final one. Point. Does chess conduct survey on party positions on Muslim minority groups, political representation in Europe? Not directly, but that's a really, really interesting question. Um, we ask, I say not directly, because we, we ask it very generally. And I think that in some countries, uh, when we ask about treatment of ethnic minorities, um, and well, we're not asking about their political representation, though. Yeah, so no, the answer to that question is no, but it's certainly something to, to consider. Do you sure. agree with that, Seth? For sure, that'd be something yeah. that uh, we would we would want to talk to somebody like Rafaela Danciguier about, um, somebody who works on that topic a lot more, um, to see to see what, yeah, what, what types of questions would be most helpful. Mm -hmm. That's a great yeah. idea. I mean, yeah, we do ask a question about how ethnic minorities are treated, um, but it's not specifically political representation. And even more importantly, it's not even close to specifically Muslim. It simply matters, you know, that that, that term is uh, obviously context dependent. What an ethnic minority means in Hungary is different than what it means in Sweden, something like that. Yeah. So, um, no, that's a great, great point. Uh, right. Okay, thank you. I think we'll wrap it up there. I see that um, the Seth and, and Ryan have answered some questions in the in the Q and A directly, typed in response as well. So hopefully that's helped to clarify a few of the remaining points. I think we covered everything. Um, thanks to everyone uh, for coming along. I hope you found that um, useful and interesting. I certainly did. Um, particular thanks to to Seth and Ryan for a really great presentation and, and Q and A at the end. Uh, and as I said, there'll be uh, I think the recording and other information circulated um, after. Uh, after the seminar. Um, so thanks everyone. Hopefully we'll see you at another one of our seminars uh, very soon. Thank Absolutely. you. Bye-bye. Thank thanks you so much. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Cheers. Stefan. Bye-bye.